your sound quality right now very good sound quality is perfect your, your sound yeah, let, let me know if we have an issue with dropouts i've recently gotten you know a, a lapel mic that i've had some difficulty getting the computer to recognize but naturally if we used it the sound would be should be better but um no, your your audio and video is coming in very clear. I'd like to introduce everybody to Chuck DeVore, the Chief National Initiatives Officer at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Chuck was a former Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you for serving. He's also a Special Assistant for Foreign Affairs during the Ronald Reagan administration. He's an ex-California Assembly member. A little bit of halfway feelings there but it's fine it's fine and he represented orange county but a couple things i really liked about you was you correctly warned people the afghanistan and uh build up during obama was not going to work you also said the libyan invasion was not going to work you also in 2009 pushed for nuclear power california now this year finally realized maybe we need that so another you know you're kind of calling these things 10, 15 years out before they blow up in everyone's faces. And finally, although I personally like the project, almost nobody does. You were one of the people who opposed the California high-speed rail and said it's not going to work out. And that's, to my lament, been 100% true. Uh, it just hasn't worked out. So you called a couple things way early on. Um, thank you for being here today. We wanted to talk to you about some of the articles that you've written. Let me just do a share screen. And this is the show we're doing today. We're gonna to be talking about Chuck's article, a national divorce, no thanks, let's just follow the constitution. And a national divorce wouldn't be as easy or as worthwhile as advertised. Chuck works at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, where he is a chief national initiatives officer there. He's also spoken frequently on Fox News, and he's written a couple books. He also has a lot of experience. One of the articles he was mentioned in was this article by Desiree News, Why Some Are Calling for a National Divorce. We've been able to interview all the professors mentioned in here. And here's a quote that, that got me, was, I would argue that they haven't fully thought through the implications of doing something like this. We also look at this article, National Divorce, No Thanks, Let's Just Follow the Constitution. And I, I really liked your analysis here. Congress has delegated far too much of its power to unelected bureaucrats. These regulators and officials invested with the power to create law, enforce law, and adjudicate law, then intrude into powers intended to be, quotes, reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. This, in turn, builds resentment, fueling talk of a no so-called national divorce. As a cell accord or sensibilities turn into regulation that binds states and citizens in far flung reaches of the Republic. But for all the talk of national divorce among some opinion leaders, its execution would be fraught with danger. And another point you made uh, ballots, bullets, or riots representation. America has been here before. And, and you talked about America has faced some tough crossroads before. So let me. Is that a fair synopsis that you're saying, hey, you know, Marjorie, well, well, let me ask you first. Have you heard about Marjorie Taylor Greene's tweet? What is your opinion of it? How do you interpret that in your words, sir? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for, for interviewing me. I think that you have a lot of individuals on the left and the right that are really frustrated with their fellow Americans. Um, you know, it seems like, for example, when certain high profile and horrific crimes occur, you'll see uh, these laments uh, and, and this, these attacks on uh, Americans that are so benighted that they somehow think they need to have private ownership of firearms and, and that they support the Second Amendment. Uh, and conversely, uh, when you have, uh, for example, uh, we, we, we heard that when the journalist, by the way, a, a liberal journalist, Matt Tiabi, was um, testifying before uh, the House on the weaponization of federal agencies. Uh, it just so happened that a uh, IRS agent showed up uninvited at his house, which is highly unusual because Matt Tiabi used a professional tax preparer, meaning that that's the contact that the IRS should have been using, not showing up uninvited at the guy's house. So how ironic, right, that 
he's testifying before the Congress, and this happens at the very moment he's testifying. Uh, so you you have these outrages, these examples that both sides point to, uh, and perhaps in more intemperate moments, they suggest, look, I just can't live in the same country as you. Uh, I think we should split. Uh, so uh, I think that for the most part, people haven't really given serious thought to this. Like, you know, how do you do this? Where does the military go? Who controls naval bases? What do we do with the national currency and debt, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, I, I certainly can't begrudge people their opinions and their frustration, but I'm pretty sure I've got the solution to it, uh, which is we need to go back to more federalism. Well, let me let me ask you a couple of questions. So the one question I've been asking everybody is, is there division in America? Is that real? Because what I saw was Stephen Colbert go on nighttime TV and I saw the Young Turks and I saw uh, Anna Kasparian and I saw Breaking Points, kind of liberal shows. And they were all saying there's no division in America. Marjorie Taylor Greene's making this all up for her own personal motivation. And they didn't bring up multiple surveys showing division. They didn't bring up landslide counties growing by 50 percent. They didn't bring up the big sorts showing Americans have been moving themselves into ideologically like minded communities for the last 15 years. They didn't bring up Joseph Biden's speech in front of a blood red backdrop with two Marines that scared the hell out of his own Democratic Party. They didn't bring up Trump causing division. It was all wiped clean. Nothing just her and her crazy mind. So who's right? Who's lying to us? Look, you know, you had a pretty comprehensive list there, Mark, but you missed a big one. What happened in California under Gavin Newsom's leadership, or was it uh, perhaps Sherry Brown, uh, when Trump was president? Right. And they led an effort to potentially exit the nation, or at the very least, develop a state compact so that they could ignore Trump's uh, federal government. How about that one? They did both. They tried to secede. And then Governor Newsom joined with two other governors and said, we're going to ignore whatever the federal government says about COVID. And I go, that's nullification. That is and that nullification. was seen right before the Civil yeah. War. Nobody yeah. in California knew what that word meant. So they're like, yeah. no, that's just us. We're not yeah. crazy like those Southerners. We just don't want to listen to the federal government and do whatever we want as we yeah. please. Congratulations, you're like the South Carolinian fire eaters. I, I'm just saying that Californians are doing the same thing and they have no clue of what they're doing. We don't want to listen to the federal government on marijuana regulation or immigration regulation. We want to make our own laws and do our own things and ignore them. But we're not crazy secessionists. I go, it's the same thing. Right. You're, you're lining up the same thing policy-wise. They don't see it. Uh, yeah, so so clearly though, this is a primarily this this issue is discussed among the uh, intelligentsia, if you will, in the U.S., uh, both conservative and left wing. Um, the average person, though, I think, is simply voting with their feet. Uh, you mentioned it earlier, the great sorting out. Uh, you see it in polls out of California, where uh, I think it's out of the Berkeley um, campus, where you've got uh, this. Uh, you know, like a public opinion, public policy uh, shop. And I think every two years they poll Californians and they ask, you know, have you thought about leaving California? Have you really thought about leaving California? I don't really know what the difference is between those two, but they ask this question pretty constantly and they slice and dice by ideology, by, by a party identification, by age, by income. And what you see is that the more conservative you are, the more likely you are to say, A, that you would like to leave California, that you've thought about leaving or really thought about moving out, and B, that the number one reason is the ideology, that you're tired of walking on eggshells and you're tired of the, the fear of being canceled uh, by this increasingly um, uh, intolerant society uh, that would dictate how you think and how you speak, you know, that somehow we have thought crimes again. And so... Californians that don't like that are prone to moving to places like Texas, which is where I moved in late 2011. And you were a California assembly member who represented the Orange County District, and you were in the government for a while. So, again, kind of a hard part for my heart, but I'm not going to lie. You got out early 
there has been a mass exodus of Californians leaving. You kind of were a uh, forerunner of that. And, and, and you did have experience in California and the government. So when you're talking about why, how California operated and why I left, I, you're in a position to say that. And right. uh, we should just listen. I, uh, for my defense, I've always said taxes are way too high here. Um, what Before I ask you a few more questions, one of the things that grabbed me was Marjorie Taylor Greene goes out there and says, and I'm, we're going to get to the federalism points you made, but I, I wanted to ask you one last question about this. Marjorie Taylor Greene says, we need a national divorce. And then a Utah governor comes out and says, we don't need a national divorce. We just need marriage counseling. And everybody covered that on the left and the right. What is marriage counseling for political division that's been increasing for 20 years solid look like? Right. Well, you got to look at it in a practical way. And I'm just going to presume that the Utah governor was thinking along the lines that I was, which is that, uh, you know, if people get resentful when you use power, whether real or implied, to tell them how they should act, where they should work, where they should live, what sort of energy that they can use, how they can spend their money. Um, all of these things you're increasingly seeing uh, coming from a very, very powerful national government, frequently from people who have not been elected, uh, people that we would uh, uh, call technocrats or you know, simply regulatory bureaucrats. Uh, and one of the reasons why this is becoming increasingly a problem, uh, let me give you two big reasons. First of all, uh, the left dominates government service when it comes to uh, unelected bureaucrats. People who are left and center tend toward government service. It's just a fact, right? So their worldview is already inclined in favor of, for example, uh, heavy regulations to address uh, their fears of climate change. Uh, that's, I think, one good example because energy affects how we live. Now, the other big reason why this is a problem is that states like California and New York and other uh, very left-wing states uh, can't be very competitive if they are the only states promulgating these policies. Right. So, for example, in California, uh, I track this very closely. I look at the Energy Information Administration. I look at the AAA uh, you know, Automobile Association website that tracks gasoline prices. And in the case of electricity prices, California typically has had the fifth or sixth highest electrical prices in the contiguous 48 states. Well, in the first 11 months of last year, so January through November of last year, they were number two in the entire country, even uh, more expensive electricity than in Alaska. Only in Hawaii, where they generate electricity with diesel generators, uh, but for the most part, uh, did they have higher electrical prices. Uh, and so the reason why places like California and New York are so attractive, attracted to these uh, kind of uh, oppressive federal policies, one size fits all, is that with a federal regulation, you can essentially wipe clean the competitive advantage that Texas might have over California, since Texas is more of a free market state with lower taxes and low, lower regulations. So if California is having a problem attracting people and jobs, and they are, California's lost population for three years in a row now, that's, that's a net loss, not not uh, like relative, but net. That's that's incredible when you think of the how beautiful California is. In the, first in the time in half a century right? or something like that. Yeah. That's the first time ever for California that it's had three years in a row. True. So, so, um, so how do you stop that? Well, you stop that by using federal power to make Texas like California. Mm. That's how you do it. Could we say then, uh, something I've seen with conservatives that I've talked to around America is that they are worried about the left or particularly California forcing California laws on them and then moving to their states and also voting wow. to change the laws. And they see it as this kind of double whammy of right. people come in and go, well, I'm more conservative uh, and maybe by California standards you are, but they move into Colorado and then immediately right. gay marriage and marijuana is legalized right, right. and conservatives there were like, we work for that. Where did all, oh, it's the Californians. And by the way, at the federal level, they also want to force all your laws changed. Right. Is this the fear you're talking about that California is going to come and force their way on you no matter what and nothing's yeah. going to stop them? So, so I think there's more nuance to that. So first of all, as I mentioned 
just a few moments ago, there is the fear that using the levers of government, um, whether directly because they control the House, the Senate, and the White House, uh, obviously no longer the House, or simply because the bureaucracy is on their side, that you use regulation to essentially impose California sensibilities on the rest of the country through things like climate change uh, regulation, et cetera, right? Now, the second question about immigration or migration, interstate migration, uh, is a little more complicated. Uh, we here at the foundation, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, we have been consistently polling on that every time we go to the field. We ask people near the end of our polls, were you born in Texas? If not, uh, where were you born? And how long ago has it been since you've moved to Texas? And so we've been creating kind of a profile of uh, the, the sorts of people that have moved to Texas and the views that they hold. And you might be surprised to learn, at least so far, that people who move to Texas are a little more conservative than native-born Texans. Now, if you um, divide between international arrivals who have become naturalized, then the, the division is even more stark. So in other words, if you if you look at, for example, people from Mexico that have naturalized, they are the most liberal group uh, in, uh, in Texas among people who move here. Okay. If, you, if you look at just domestic migration, people from the Rocky Mountain West that moved to Texas are the most conservative. And Californians are, are actually pretty conservative. Now, think about this, uh, Mark. When you think about uh, math and you fi figure that um, conservatives generally have larger families than do uh, left-wingers, uh, and you look at California getting progressively more left-wing through time, well, if, if the left isn't having a lot of children, uh, and if uh, California is getting more left wing, where are all those liberals coming from? Well, I would argue it's because people like me have left the state. And that's what, one of the reasons why California is getting more liberal. Uh, one last data point for you. In the 2019, pardon me, 2018 U.S. Senate race here in Texas, uh, up to that time, the most expensive U.S. Senate race in history and until that honor was probably stolen in subsequent uh, cycles. You had uh, Congressman, then Congressman Beto O'Rourke and Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz was running for his first reelect. Uh, Ted only won by just a little over two points. I think it was like you know 2.7% yeah. or something like that. CNN did an exit poll. Uh, and one of the things they asked in their exit poll is, are you a Texas native or did you move here? By the way, move here like Ted Cruz did. Ted Cruz was born of, uh, of a U.S. Uh, citizen mother in Canada. Uh, and so um, by 18 percent, well, let me get this straight, 15 percent, it was 15 percent, uh, people who had moved to Texas voted for Cruz over O'Rourke. And that's wow. roughly 40 percent of the Texas electorate. Forty percent are people who didn't weren't born here. The 60 wow. percent of Texans who were natives voted for O'Rourke by plus three. So you had an 18 point spread. Now, you know, look, uh, exit polls can be kind of fluey, uh, not necessarily known for their, you know, perfect scientific accuracy. Sure. But that exit poll validated by and large subsequent polling we've done here at the foundation. Now you go back and you talk about Colorado. Uh, I would argue that people moving to different states, uh, there's different levels of commitment. You know, the Rocky Mountain uh, West all the way to the Pacific Coast has this, um, uh, you know, reputation for being kind of libertarian, leave me alone sort of people. But I think a lot of people in modern times uh, often erroneously conflate uh, libertarianism with libertinism. Uh, and so, you know, hey, uh, you know, let me do my own thing, which may include some pretty, you know, uh, uh, you know, that um, things I would be yeah. right? And, and so when you look at, for example, if you're a Californian and you're moving to Las Vegas, I mean, heck, you can drive from Vegas to Los Angeles in less time than you could drive from Los Angeles to San Francisco. And same with moving to Phoenix, Arizona. You can, you know, that's a six hour drive. It takes yeah. eight hours to go from Orange County up to Sacramento. True. So there's different levels of commitment, you know, and culturally speaking, uh, Colorado was. Uh, in many respects, culturally closer to California than it was to Texas. And so, you, you know, if you're a left winger, 
and you're going to move to Texas, other than maybe Austin, which has been pretty left wing for a long time, um, you know, that's kind of scary, right? Texans like their guns. They like their rodeo. They like their big trucks. They like oil. These are all things that most left wing Californians would turn their nose up at and said, are you kidding? I'm not going to move there. Uh, full disclosure. So I'm half Mexican. The Mexican side is Tejano near Amarillo. I'm sorry, Amarillo. Amarillo. <laughs> yes. I have a lot Amarillo. of cousins here. Yeah. Amarillo. Spelled Amarillo, pronounced Amarillo. I wish yeah. California. And don't ask me about Texas pronunciation. They, they have a logic of their own. I've, I've slowly gotten uh, acculturated and I'm, <laughs> I'm corrected less often now that I've been here for for 12 years you're a good man you're a good man you need a lot of patience uh that's what we tell the californians the barbecue is worth it but let me let me ask you i have heard you, you said some shocking statistics that that i didn't know um a lot of native texans were liberal a lot of imported texans were somewhat conservative because the story that i've heard is that you have something called the urban triangle an area right. between dallas uh, Fort Worth down to Houston, then over San Antonio, and then over, and it makes yeah. kind of a triangle. And that seems to be where like 90% of your blue vote comes from. Correct. And I have heard, and I don't know, it's only that way because you had a bunch of uh, foreign people and liberal Californians move there, and then they switched the vote. It's not really native tech. Yeah, you know, so but there's a like big event that happened uh, in 2005, if I remember correctly, called Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and when Hurricane Katrina happened, you had FEMA and other uh, organizations, charitable organizations in many cases, help to relocate, uh, if I remember correctly, over uh, 200,000 individuals, mostly from the right. uh, New Orleans area, and they went to Houston. Uh, and so uh, that obviously did affect the um, voting patterns in Harris County, which is the third largest county in the United States. If it was a state, I think it would be the 26th largest state. So, um, yeah, I mean, these things do happen, uh, but it's not unfolding the way, you know, the, the popular fear or the narrative is. And I have the data to prove it. Now, again, these things can always change, right? They, you know, migration is not static. It, it's, sure. it's, a, it's a constantly uh, morphing sort of thing. Uh, but our information does indicate uh, the you know as we polled at the granular level where did you come from and so if you look at the uh, immigration that's come into texas from louisiana it's pretty uh, it's pretty liberal it's, it's pretty democratic uh so you know that that's a thing um can't stop people from moving here for opportunity and one hopes that as time goes on uh and as they look around and see what works and what doesn't work uh, that eventually uh, they may reconsider their political leanings. By the way, this is one of the reasons why our foundation is so four square behind uh, parental empowerment or school choice. Uh, is If you look, for example, in Houston, uh, the Houston ISD, Independent School District, was just taken over. It's in conservatorship because it's been consistently failing a, a huge segment, up to half of its students uh, end up graduating without even knowing how to read or do arithmetic. And those areas where you have that high rate of failure are in the black areas of town. Uh, and in fact, you have um, a very prominent, long time serving member of the Texas House, a Democrat named Harold Dutton, uh, who just quit from the Black Caucus um, just uh, in the last day or two, uh, largely due in part to this issue where you have the left wing of the mm. Black Caucus here in Texas lining up behind the teachers' unions uh, to keep things the way they are, and Harold Dutton realizing that it's not working for the kids in his district. Uh, and so, you know, I look at things like that, and I, I think, you know, um, politics changes. The, nothing is static ever about politics. Fair. Fair. I could see that. And we had... Um... I've seen that too in Los Angeles and in the Bay Area. That may surprise you, but Latino and African American families complaining that they want a charter school or an independent school because they've had the public schools. They don't think it works. They want to try something else. And they're running smack dab into their minority community leaders saying, no, we back the teachers union. Right. We're not doing that. And I go, well, I'm a parent. 
how come I don't get a pick where my kid wants to go to? And I'm Latin and, and I'm black. So please don't give me the whole I'm a sellout thing. I'm a parent. I, right. I've seen what you're talking about. I've seen it. No, I'm not taking a stance, but I've seen what you're talking about. Is it? Well, and, and if I may, very briefly, that's a very sick sad thing about it was that California was an early adopter of charters and for a while uh, had, as I recall, 4% of the students uh, enrolled in alternatives to public education. They were leading the nation in many respects. Uh, And of course, you had, uh, you know, the the terrible reaction to that by the California Teachers Association and other union groups to say, no, no, we can't let this happen. We need to uh, put them under the same rules and restrictions as public schools and do everything we can to erase any sort of a competitive advantage that they have. And uh, unfortunately, I think they largely succeeded. This is a union state. It might be the last union state out of 50. I know there was a lot of unions going back to the 1950s, but California is still heavily pro-union. So it's it's a little difficult to fight unions here on, on almost any issue that there's a union. Um, let me ask you though, uh, we are gonna get to federalism as the solution, but I wanna ask you, have things gotten better in five years with political division? Have they gotten worse? Have they stayed the same? And if we don't institute the federalism you're talking about, if, if somebody doesn't come and wave a wand and manage, oh, federalism's here, we're all cool now, is it going to get worse right. or is it going to get better? Where do you, how, Is there division in America? How bad is it? And where right. do you see it going in the future provided we don't do anything to fix it? Right. So I think there, there are three huge factors that are weighing on this, uh, only one of which is federalism. Uh, and really, the other two are going to be very difficult to fix. The first is social media. You have large social media com- com- companies, pardon me, that make a living by firing people up, by getting people angry. They, they have algorithms that very specifically know how to manipulate human emotion make people angry, get more engagement, get that dopamine hit, uh, and stay online. And so what's begun to happen is you have people frequently with anonymous accounts or not who will say things to other Americans that they would never say to their face, right, because it's not polite or because they might get punched in the nose by some person bigger than them. And so that's a phenomena that has been unleashed And it's going to be really hard to get that genie back in the bottle. So that's number one. Number two is uh, over the last several decades, our higher education establishments have become almost monotonously left wing. Uh, You know, they talk about diversity. There's very little diversity of thought in most of higher education in America today. Now, thankfully, a lot of parents are beginning to realize that the value of uh, higher education is a lot less uh, than it used to be. You you go back about 100 years ago, roughly 10, 13% of Americans uh, had the ability to access higher education. You had the GI Bill with the advent of World War II and the veterans returning home. And then Congress in its infinite wisdom decided that, well, you know, everybody should have that benefit. Everybody should go to college. I always get a kick out of that, right? Um, You know, the, the whole issue with IQ is that there is a standard distribution. There is a bell-shaped curve. And by definition, uh, half of all people are below average and half are above average when it comes to intelligence. And you think about college and you wonder, wow, you know, really? Should we have college for everyone? Is that a good use of our resources? Might some people perhaps be better suited by their, by their uh, you know, disposition or their intelligence or their ambition? to do other things that may not require college and may not require that investment of four or five or six years and in, in going into debt. But for some reason now, we, we think that everyone needs to go to college. And unfortunately, then what happens is a lot of kids get indoctrinated. And so now you're beginning to see a split in America that mirrors a split that started to emerge in Western Europe about 30 years ago. And the split is this. The more educated you are in America, the more left wing you are in America. And so you're beginning to see what used to be, for example, upper income individuals who were in business, they were executives 40, 50 years ago, they were largely Republicans. Now they are almost uniformly Democrats. Uh, And so that problem isn't going to change much uh, anytime soon. And what what you saw with the Trump 
candidacy for president in 2016 was kind of the inflection point of the curve. That is the point at which you saw large numbers of people that in 1980 or 1984 were called Reagan Democrats and then you know would drift in and out of considering a vote for the Republican Party. And then you saw with the advent of the Trump candidacy, uh, a large wave that really shattered uh, what had been a long time alliance between the Democratic Party and the white working class. Right. Uh, and that's right. changed. That's right, changed. Right, right. So then the Big third issue there. is federalism, right? The third issue that, that is more in our control is federalism, uh, which uh, allows people to live their lives as they would like to see their lives ordered by voting for their elected representatives uh, at the state and local level. Uh, and, you know, really under our system, states are supposed to have uh, the primacy on things like criminal law, on property rights, on a whole host of issues that are not preempted by the Constitution and its 14th Amendment guarantee of equal rights to, to everyone. Uh, so, uh, you know, as long as a state doesn't seek to do something stupid like reimpose slavery or something, uh, pretty much uh, a lot of uh, that waterfront of policy is is open, is fair for states to decide how how they uh, you know want to order their affairs. Uh, and so uh, I think that the, the challenge that we have now is this increasingly powerful federal government is encroaching on states, not only through uh, regulatory means, Mark, uh, the other big thing is the federal government borrows an enormous amount of money, much of which is sent down to the states with uh, with specific strings attached. That right. You spend this money if you do it, if you spend it the way we at the federal government want you to spend it. And, and that's very pernicious because you're borrowing from future generations, you're borrowing from China, and you're sending this money down to states who have inherent taxing authority that if California, for example, wants to fund what is uh, the largest welfare uh, system in the country, you know, roughly 11% of the population uh, and roughly, you know, 35, 40% of the, the nation's welfare recipients, uh, mostly subsidized with federal funds. Well, look, if California wants to do that by increasing their, their income taxes or their sales taxes, they can do it. The, the, the voters can vote for that. But instead, what we're doing is we're using largely borrowed federal money to right. fund that California program. There was a governor in California a long time ago who gave a famous black and white interview. His name was Ronald Reagan. And he said this the first year that he was elected as California governor before he knew he was going to be president. It makes no sense for us to package up all these federal taxes, ship it to the federal government, pay for somebody to manage the money, and then tell us how to spend it and send it back. Why don't you just keep it here in the state? He literally said that year one as he was governor. Uh, so it's it's that, you know, and I, I love pointing that out. I go, you know, Reagan said this himself um, early on. Let me ask you. Division seems to be, in your opinion, due to social media increasing division. Universities are essentially becoming all left uh, and destroying diversity of thought and the lack of federalism. I, I don't see the university issue getting fixed anytime soon. I don't see the social media issue getting fixed anytime soon. Is there a chance for federalism, as you suggest, is a potential solution to this discussion on national divorce. How how likely we are to see that? Uh, before your answer, I would like to point out one thing. The Supreme Court instituted federalism recently with overturning Roe v. Wade. They took it at the federal level and kicked it down, back down to the states. Uh, immediately, every left state rejected that and kind of lied to their own people and said, oh, they're taking all our rights away, which was, I know in California, people were jumping up and down going, they're taking our rights away. And I go, no, they're not. But it's it's kicked down to this. Nobody wanted to hear that. No, no liberals wanted to hear, no, 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 I'll just take it away because the federal government. And I thought that was bad enough. But then I saw Mike Pence, the vi former vice president, say, you know what? Just because it was kicked down to the states, not good enough. Let's force a national abortion ban. And I thought, 
wow, that's stupid, because the Republicans have been talking about federalism, federalism, federalism for decades. And then the moment they get it, right. one of the top ranking Republicans says, screw federalism. Let's go back to forcing things at the national level. Isn't that the total opposite of the message? Where does yeah. federalism stand now? Yeah, I, you, you happen to pick like one of the most um, interesting topics on that, because on just about everything else, it'd be pretty clear one way or the other. Uh, but there's a lot of parallels uh, philosophically uh, and legally uh, between the issue of abortion and the matter of personhood and rights, inherent rights, uh, God-given rights, uh, and the battle we fought over slavery. In fact, um, a huge number of parallels. And so just like with the slavery debate, you can argue whether it's politically wise to try to pick this fight now, given the current status in the country and current divisions. Uh, maybe it might be wise to try to win a Republican primary, uh, but uh, conversely, it might not be so wise to win a general election. Mm. Uh, but you can't discount the philosophical arguments because what you find is in American history, as uh, we began to industrialize uh, and as the value of the cotton gin began to reach its full a force and effect and the fact that they were able to begin to get economic value from a type of cotton that couldn't be grown uh, in most areas, uh, or pardon me, it could be grown in most areas, but because of its seeds, uh, it didn't have a lot of economic value because it took too much labor to be able to separate the seeds from the strands of cotton. Well, the cotton gin solved that and it dramatically increased the value of slave labor uh, after 1800. And so what you saw then in the South in the period of 60 years from 1800 to 1860 is a, a gradual hardening of attitudes about slavery and a development of philosophy that denied personhood to black slaves. Uh, and mm -hmm. what I find interesting is that the language used to, de to, to deny personhood and rights to black slaves uh, has a significant parallels to the same language used to deny personhood of unborn children. Uh, and so uh, you could argue just from a purely uh, constitutional and philosophical vein uh, that there are some things that just cannot be allowed. That, in fact, was one of the founding premises of the Republican Party back in, I think, 1855 uh, was uh, the Republican Party was founded in opposition to, and I'm paraphrasing, those twin pillars of barbarism, slavery and polygamy. Uh, and the attitude was it doesn't matter if a majority say it's okay, there are certain things that just aren't okay. Uh, and, and so for example, if a majority of California leftists decided that if you were conservative, you should be enslaved or you should somehow lose their, your freedom, well, we'd say that's ridiculous, right? You're, you right. can't do that, right? Well, then, wait right. a minute, that's democracy, that's majority rule. Well, that's why we don't have democracy. We have, we have a constitutional republic. We have a, a yeah. democratic republic, right? There's a big difference. Right. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, so so I, I think that when you look at federalism, I think that by and large, uh, to the degree that the founders, uh, 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 you know, saw it, uh, that you leave things up to the states, for example, criminal justice, you know, your penal code, um, you, you know, how do you want to order your transportation network? You know, are you going to have more mass transit or are you going to have more freeways? Are you going to have high speed rail? You know, all these things are things that states ought to be able to decide uh, through their elected representatives uh, and, you know, just experiment, see how it works out for you. And maybe other states will copy you or maybe you'll serve as a warning to other states like, yeah, don't do that. That doesn't work. Let's not let's not go there. Uh, and so I think that that's um, uh, part of the, the issue. Now, getting back to higher education, I do see hope, though. You're beginning to see uh, uh, more alternatives being funded by wealthy individuals who know our current system is failing here in uh, Austin, for example, we have the University of Austin that's been developed that is, um, you know, consciously not left wing. Uh, plus, you're seeing, again, more and more parents and students realizing uh, that it's just not smart to go into debt $60,000 to get some liberal arts degree that has virtually no application to the workforce and making your labor more valuable. And so that's becoming more acceptable now for people just to bypass uh, uh, the, you know, going to college, maybe getting a technical certificate, for example, uh, for software coding or learning how to weld 
uh, you know, obviously welders frequently work in difficult conditions, uh, but they can easily make six figures. If Absolutely. They do. Uh, and uh, I think it's just important that we, we get away from denigrating, um, uh, you know, working with your hands. I mean, I was a, I was a dues paying union carpenter for a few years uh, in California as I was paying for college until I got my army scholarship that uh, let me go to Claremont McKenna College. So, um, you know, I know how to work with my hands. I, I, I get out my toolbox uh, uh, at least once a month to fix something at my house or to build something. Uh, and so, uh, although recently it's been nothing but my chainsaw recovering from that huge ice storm we had a few oh, ago. Yeah. Uh, I, I hauled concrete hose when I was 18. Uh, ah, so there you go. Very difficult job. Your biceps. Yeah. What? Well, yeah, it was a, it was a tough job. Tough job. Uh, uh, and for everybody, that's they have a fire hose and they fill it with concrete, and then you walk up and you have to hold fifty feet of line and walk it to the guy who's at the top of the wall to pour it in. So it's it's a tough job. They gave it to the seventeen year old. Uh, I didn't know what I was getting into, and they said, well, like, <laughs> "Break your break your back. You'll be fine. You can get over it." <laughs> Uh, but let me ask you, do we, I still see social media division as a problem going forward. I still see universities in left states staying hardcore left, banning speakers. Uh, and I saw where we had a real chance to implement federalism and the former vice president shot that down and then was backed by a bunch of Republicans. Do we have a chance for division to get better in America? Uh, just not yeah. what we want. Do you think if there isn't a big change, division's going to just naturally get better on its own or it would get worse? Well, again, you have to look at the practical effects of division, right? So is the division such that people seriously want to break the country up or is the division such that we can live with each other in kind of this uneasy a truce, you know, where, where Texans can go enjoy a vacation on a beach in California uh, and Californians can enjoy the benefits of using abundant and, uh, uh, and, and and reliable Texas energy in the form of natural gas, right? Uh, and, and so if it's simply, look, you know, I think my neighbor is weird. I don't appreciate his, his uh, uh, hygiene practices, right? Uh, I don't like his junk car in his front yard. Uh, but you know, as long as he's not uh, uh, infringing directly on my quiet enjoyment, uh, then look, you know, he, he's fine to do his own thing. Uh, and so I think that's what where I get back to the federalism argument is that um, if you're going to use federal power, if you're going to use government power to force people to do a certain thing that they never voted for, and frankly, uh, where you would not win in their state, right, on that issue, uh, then, then back the heck off and let them do their own thing. So long as it's not violative of our God-given rights as set out in our Constitution, specifically the Bill of Rights, you know, the, the, the 14th Amendment, which applied those rights to the individual states, right? That was one of the reasons, again, I mean, uh, again, we, we, need to, we need to be very careful to, uh, to parse the argument that federalism does not give states the right to allow, for example, slavery in their state, right. because that is taking away a God-given right of liberty from the citizens of the United States. Uh, and so it doesn't mean, federalism doesn't mean that state governments can do anything they want. What it means is they can, they can do anything they want within the confines of the Constitution, Sure. The, the foremost thing being that they cannot deny without due process uh, God-given rights to their citizens. Sure. But my my yes, absolutely. My concern is that I don't see much on the horizon that suggests an increased appetite for federalism. The first thing right. I point to is Roe v. Wade. Mike Pence said, let's do a national thing. A lot of Republicans backed him. That's not federalism. And then I see a bunch of conservatives yeah. talking about they want a gun registration that's registered in one state and then it's uh, concealed carry across all two. That's not federalism either. So right. if the traditional party pushing federalism is pushing non-federalism ideas, and if yeah. the left wants absolutely nothing to do with federalism, what hope do we have as Americans that people will be open to more federalism? Right. So, so again, I think, 
I think like any good arguer does, you're picking two very high profile points uh, to, to make your point. OK, so if I if I may, uh, going back to the former vice president's remarks in context, remember that at that moment when he said that you had Democratic control of both the House and the Senate and a president who said, OK, fine, we will vote to codify Roe v. Wade nationally through legislation. Right. So uh, Pence's uh, comment was simply a pushback to what was suggested at the time to codify it when the Democrats had the White House and both chambers of Congress. Um, and, uh, you know, by the way, that that could be fair game. You know, I, I'd argue that such a codification would step on traditional areas of state sovereignty. Uh, now, you mentioned the, 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 the issue of guns. OK. Uh, again, that's a great point because you, you certainly know how to argue your case. The challenge with that specific issue that you brought up is that there is, in the Second Amendment, an individual right to, to own firearms. Uh, and, and the founders thought strongly enough about it that they put it in the Bill of Rights. It's number two. Um, now, if you had picked, let's say, a, a completely different topic that was not in the Constitution, I think you'd have uh, a, a more clear um, example of, of transgressions, right? So, for example, let's let's think of uh, let's think of something. Uh, let's let's say you have Congress deciding that we have to have uniform uh, family laws uh, regarding divorce and marriage uh, and adoption and things like that. Well, that is clearly the domain of of, of the states and uh, would be inappropriate for Congress to legislate on, on something like that. Um, it, it's something that's not in the Constitution. Uh, and, um, and, and I would argue that that would be you know, a more clear violation. Uh, but what I'm also arguing, Mark, is that a huge part of our problem with federalism comes from uh, the body of regulation where Congress is empowered uh, and delegated a tremendous authority to different uh, executive branch agencies and independent agencies uh, that that essentially uh, pass regulations right. that have the, the the effect of the force of law. And if you uh, if you think I'm wrong, uh, try no, no, I agree. One of them. And no, I, this is a rhetorical question. If you think I'm wrong, try violating one of them and see what happens to you. See how long it is before you are are imposed a fine, and if you don't pay the fine, or hauled off to federal prison. I was telling some younger people uh, a few months ago that most of the laws that we have were not actually passed by the lawmakers; they were passed by the appointed regulatory officials. Uh, you know, e even here in Sacramento or Washington D.C., they're not going to spend the time to design the law down to the nitty gritty. They just go generally sell less gas using cars and buy more electric here. You figure out the details. And it's some person you've never heard of, you did not vote for. Technically they were appointed by somebody who won a fair election. Okay. But it's, it's a third person you don't really know. And then they actually design the laws and you basically just accept it. We do that with air quality and climate change here right. all the time in California, and people go, where do these regulations come from? People you don't know of, basically, right. is the answer. Uh, and it's a great tool because what it allows the, the politician to do is to avoid uh, blame, uh, to avoid right. consequences of doing that. Right. Uh, and, and as a result, if someone comes and complains, well, gee, I didn't do it. it, it it's yes, um, I didn't do it. And if the regulations are bad, you can go bad regulator bad that guy that lady or woman's fired i i would never allow this on my watch and i you know the moment it came to my attention i replaced them for sure uh well let me ask you the opposite let's assume federalism doesn't get better in america and division gets worse but there's not much appetite for increased federalism what would you say to people then who say Wow, division's still bad. National divorce is still bad. I, I hear you. Federalism was the better option, but 
You know, these pesky liberals or these pesky Republicans won't let us do it. What would you say to that person? You know, what? what yeah, I mean, that's a that's, of course, a, a very depressing hypothetical. Right. And we've been creeping in that direction, sometimes galloping uh, uh, for quite some time. Um, I don't think that the current system is sustainable. So let me just put that on the table. Let me just let me, let me push back on your assertion. Uh, because if you look at the level of borrowing that we're doing now, if, if you look at the shape of our economy, um, this gravy train will come to an end. What cannot go on forever must eventually end. And a huge part of what underpins this um, assault on federalism is, as I mentioned before, the hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars that are borrowed and sent down to the states who gladly lap up the money but that have strings attached that tell the states how to run these different programs. That's going to end. That will end. Uh, And with it, an enormous amount of the ability of the federal government to essentially commandeer state power, uh, state policing Mm -hmm. power, regulatory power. Uh, The federal government doesn't have nearly enough people, uh, nearly enough law enforcement officers, nearly enough regulators who have Uh, law enforcement capacity to enforce their edicts on the entire country without the ability to commandeer state police power uh, for their purposes. Totally agree. We saw that here in California, not asking you to agree with the policy, but we said, we don't like your immigration policy. And the Fed said, well, you can't do it. And we said, fine, we're not going to help you. Come and police it yourself. And they didn't do a very good job when they realized they got to regulate 40 million people. Oh, my God, we do not have people this. So, yeah, I'm not a, you don't have to endorse the policy, but absolutely agree with you. So you're saying dollar falls or, or the, uh, the economy starts to reduce. They just can't pump out money and give it to everybody. And if they're not given the goodies, they right. don't have the ability to go. Well, now you have to do what I say. Right. And you, you see. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're going in. We've had stellar inflation. Uh, we've had bank collapse. They're trying to get the banks out by backing them with printing more money, which will only increase inflation. We have uh, inflation and we basically had stagflation for the first time since the 1970s. I was, I was pointing that out to people and they go, what does that word mean? And I go, look it up. It's the worst possible form of inflation. Haven't seen it in about half a century. It's here now. Yeah. And then you also look at the fact that um, China and Russia have formed this currency-backed monetary union. Uh, and they've gotten about 15 other major countries, including Mexico and Saudi Arabia, to agree to use this alternative currency for international trade. That will replace the dollar as the international trade currency. And that will massively ruin the dollar's value when all those things come to play i think what you're saying is federal government just won't have they won't be the big spender to give money out to everybody and then demand it'll, it'll be pretty difficult and of course uh, if the dollar loses its shine as the world's uh, reserve currency then uh from what i understand that would probably add a, at least another percentage uh interest point to uh, to loans uh, we derive a tremendous advantage of central banks all over the world holding our uh, our money as a reserve currency. It helps keep our own interest rates down. Now, that said, uh, for all of our troubles and weaknesses, I think it's in, important to understand that the Chinese currency is going to have a hard time in the long haul from uh, displacing the dollar for one very simple reason, which is that um, as frustrated as many of us are with the actions of the Federal Reserve, uh, they are done. Uh, They are published. Everything, you know, once a decision is made, everything's open. We know what's going on. Uh, Whereas within China, uh, the yuan, the value of their their currency, uh, exists at the whim of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, And so, um, you know, it's hard to replace something with nothing. And while a lot of countries are not happy with us right now and they're seeking alternatives. I think over the long haul, I can't imagine the Chinese Communist Party giving up its ability to manipulate the yuan as they see fit. Uh, mm. And that's going to limit its effectiveness. Mm. Great point. So, hey, if you want to become the world reserve currency, 
you're going to have to do some of the things the Americans did, like uh, transparency in the banking. So you have financial investors around the world feel comfortable investing in yours. OK, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, I would just point out that, you know, we had the recession in the 1930s caused in America. We had a recession in 2008 caused here in America. Looks like we're going into another possible recession caused here in America. That's three. That doesn't look good to international investors going, let's invest our money in the people who constantly cause global collapse. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, um, you know, our discomfort is often the um, opportunity of others and not just from a predatory standpoint with regard to the People's Republic of China, but also, uh, you know, investors that manage to uh, call it correctly and, and buy up assets when they're cheap or distressed. Right. Uh, you know, as long as you let the system work, my big fear uh, is that we've gotten into this crony corporatism where people who are tight with regulators, tight with the people in power, uh, manage to avoid consequences of their bad decision making. In many cases, by the way, following federal policies, we, we saw that with the Great Recession that was largely caused by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and federal policies that said, look, we need to increase home ownership among disadvantaged minorities who have bad credit. Right, so right. Need to make these subprime loans to people who, frankly, are going to have a difficult time uh, paying reliably on that loan. That's why they have bad credit in the first place, right, is they have a bad credit history. Uh, and so we inflated the housing market. We pumped it up. Uh, and then as those uh, institutions began to collapse, um, we rescued most of them. And uh, doing so is called moral hazard. So when you have uh, somebody, when you have somebody who who is there to back you up, regardless of whether you do wrong or right, then what you're going to start to do is you're going to engage in more risky behavior, knowing that you will never really pay the consequences for it. Uh, and so that's unfortunately what we're getting right now. I, I saw the, I think it was the Frontline PBS episode where they covered that. Hey, it only took them seven years to figure it out, right? That's the good news is that people were saying, you're just going to bail them out with no uh, penalty fees, huh? At least, at least seven years later, they figured out. At least Janet Yellen, when she says there's no problem with recession and the recession happens, at least she goes on TV and says, I'm sorry, that makes me feel better. That I think that secures financial markets. When you have the head of the Federal Reserve massively call it wrong and then just go, whoops, I feel bad. I, yeah, I, I think that says stability in the U.S. financial system that tells creditors and regulators, investors, this is a good place. These people are not running a monkey show. What it, Just to back up what you're saying, there's a movie called, I don't know if you can see it, The Big Sort uh, with Christian yeah. Bale talks exactly about what you're talking about. It's a review of the 2008 financial collapse. And what happened was uh, he's this investor. There was one investor who in California who was kind of weird, but he, he predicted the collapse before anybody else did. And uh, in return for him pointing out there was going to be a collapse, the FBI sent people to investigate him. In the of process. course. Of so course. That's, that's what you get when you say that. But they finally got yeah. the movie out. And the big turning point of the movie is this guy's trying to figure out how do we get here? And he finally gets to some federal regulatory authority who was supposed to check the paperwork of these banks. And he goes, so what, what did you find when you checked them out? We didn't check them out. What do you mean you didn't check them out? That's your job. I, we're friends. I right. used to work there. Now I work here. He used regulatory to work there. capture, it's called. He told me it's cool. So I assumed it was cool. And they go, hold on, you never actually checked into this, even though you're the official body to do it. No, bro, we, we thought it was cool. We're homies. Yeah. And that's and in this one five minute scene, you see that's why the entire US financial system collapsed because yeah. we don't actually have regulatory bodies that do their job. It's too difficult. And it's easier to just be buddies and let somebody go the other way. I mean, nobody was punished for 2008. Nobody went to prison. Wall Street bankers, all of them are fine. So, and like you were saying, they bailed out these banks who did this stuff. And I, I remember learning that the guy who was in charge of Lehman Brothers was also the guy in charge of the Silicon Valley Bank. One of them, yeah. 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 So, 
what that tells me is there's no punishment for collapsing the entire U.S. economy. You can just get another job and do it again. And I bet you he's not going to be prosecuted now. So does that build trust in the financial system when there's so much monkey business and not one person is brought no, to justice? Of course, of course it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. But then uh, part of the challenge is that you can't see these things in isolation. You have to look at at the entire world financial system, sure. so, you know, got to Switzerland, where, for example, Credit Suisse just collapsed and, sure. and it was purchased by its larger rival. And so, um, uh, when it when it comes to these shenanigans in America, none of which I, I approve of, and, and think, you know, by the way, I was criticized uh, when I was running for the U.S. Senate in California in 2010. Uh, people like David Frum uh, asked me when he interviewed me about whether whether I agreed with the uh, the bailout, uh, and uh, I said no, I don't agree with the bailout. I think that 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 you know, look, you know, when when the automobile uh, uh, manufacturers were teetering on bankruptcy, if they go bankrupt, it's not like the factory evaporates overnight. No, all the capital is still there. Mm. Uh, it's just that you you have different investors. They can renegotiate with the unions. They can break those contracts and and negotiate something that might work better and be more sustainable. Uh, and they could come out of it stronger. But then the investors who aren't paying attention to their investment as much, well, they get a haircut, right? They lose their money. Good. That's the way it's supposed to work in a in a competitive capitalistic system. But we prevented all of that stuff from happening. And so I was criticized heavily for uh, thinking that we shouldn't have bailed out the, uh, the, the financial institutions. And by the way, uh, there is a video footage of me in when I was in the legislature arguing from the floor in 2007, prior to the hit of the Great Recession, arguing for uh, fiscal restraint, saying that these warning signs were out there, that the economy is slowing, and that the way California collects its money, we're going to rue the day that we spent every penny and that we should be pulling back because uh, slow times are coming. And if I remember the timing correctly of that floor speech, Seven months later was the official onset of the Great uh, Recession. You were right. They were wrong. I I love California, but it's mostly for our progressive values. But we are horrible with taxes, business climate, and and uh, budgeting. I, I, I love this place, but I'm not going to lie. We we don't. That the the last Republican we had here in California was Jerry Brown. Most people don't get that because he's technically a Democrat, but huh. like Jerry Brown was the last governor who would tell all these liberals, right. no, we're not going to spend the surplus on everything that you want. It's yeah. called a surplus so that when the economy collapses, we keep it right. there. The moment right. he was gone, yeah. that was spent in about five seconds. I mean, yeah. the yeah. moment he was gone, they're like, oh, is there money? Take, grab. And then we got rid of it and then we had nothing for... Um, you know, the next recession we went into. So yeah. should be very doing. interesting to see how California fares going from almost a hundred billion dollar surplus last year to what looks to be north of 30 billion now. So uh, hold on to your uh, wallet because I think tax increases are coming. Yeah. Um, it's not. Yeah. Uh, a lot better. Uh, w one last question in Texas, we're talking about political division what do we do? Federalism, maybe something else. Just hypothetically, if the urban triangle with the three major metro areas was a separate blue state, I think that represents about one eighth or one ninth of the total landmass of Texas, leaving about the other eight ninths red. In a hypothetical scenario, not asking you to endorse it, just saying hypothetically, alternate universe, not even this one, alternate universe. Thanos universe, Marvel. If you had this blue state and you had the red Texas be a red state, wouldn't those new states be politically cohesive for a while? I mean, it, the blue state's going to stay real blue for a long time. And the red part of the rest of Texas is probably going to stay red for a long time. There's a few other liberal cities, but they would be overwhelmed by conservatives. If they did split, wouldn't we see some sort of political calming because you don't really have the blue state's going to be 80% blue. The red part of Texas is going to be 80% red. It's, there's no real division anymore. It's, you know, this group's in charge. That's the way it is. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting question. I think maybe you're seeing some uh, uh, 
almost like a, 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 a branch to that, um, that interesting idea uh, happening here in Austin, Texas, which in many respects is the most culturally left wing uh, part of the state. Right. Right. At least of any consequence. Right. Uh, and what I find found fascinating is that just a couple of days ago, the uh, Department of Public Safety, which is like the uh, Texas Troopers, kind of the equivalent of, of California Highway Patrol, okay, uh, announced uh, that an agreement where they were going to come in and help the Austin Police Department enforce laws in Austin because things are getting out of control here. Uh, and it's like, well, okay, how do they get out of control? Well, they, they started to defund the police when that was the Vogue thing to do. And in 2019, they rescinded a city ordinance that prohibited camping by homeless uh, people on the street in public places. Uh, now, things got so bad so quickly with people coming from all over Texas and, frankly, other parts of the country to beg for money for drugs and to sleep out in the open uh, that the... Uh, people of Austin uh, qualified a ballot proposition, which is fairly rare in, in Texas. We don't have it statewide. We have it at the local level, um, uh, statewide by popular initiative, right? The, right? the legislature can put a constitutional amendment on the ballot, but, but you don't have the initiative process statewide here like you do in California. But at the local level, they do. And so what was interesting is not only did the legislature pass a law overriding localities from doing that, but in the same uh, breath, politically speaking, uh, the, the, the voters of Austin voted to rescind the ordinance. Now, the city council, very, very left wing here, said, fine, we, we won't enforce it. Right. I mean, you know, make us and mm. make us uh, enforce our problem here. So you saw a slight decline in the vacancy. Uh, but um, it's bad enough The last week a, um, a homeless man. Uh, burned down the building, two buildings away from us. And so all throughout the TPPF headquarters, our six-story building, two blocks from the state capitol, we've got these big air scrubbers going. It cracked the fire windows on our fourth and fifth floor uh, and burned the roof of the architectural firm next to us, right? And, and within 24 hours of that, uh, a constituent that was out to see a Republican state senator uh, about some issues was uh, assaulted and, and sexually assaulted by a homeless guy, um, uh, you know, blocks from the Capitol. Okay, so why do I say that in response to your question? Well, well my, my contention is, if you were to have an area that was that blue and that cut off from common sense, uh, I think that very quickly you'd see something like, uh, well, I don't know, Escape from New York or uh, Rogue, <laughs> you know, where you'd have this um, dangerous hellscape of, <laughs> of dysfunction uh, and uh, something that's only held in check right now by the fact that you have this condominium between the uh, suburban and rural areas that uh, are, are to the right uh, that are conservative and the uh, big um, uh, urban areas. By the way, uh, if you're an urban liberal, uh, and you finally uh, see someone that catches your fancy and you decide to have a family, um, the large percentage of those move out to the countryside or to the suburbs because they can't afford the housing in the urban area That's and they don't point. like the crime. That's a good point. That's a good point. That's a very good point. So if, I'll just leave it at, if Texas turns blue <laughs> and they're voting 70% blue, even though you left California and you went to a more conservative climate and then that state returns blue, you would be cool with it and stay in Texas? This is my last stand. There, there is no other Texas to go to. Uh, Texas uh, is my Alamo. And I'm just hoping that unlike the Alamo from which there were no survivors of the defenders, um, that uh, uh, th this is where I'm making my last stand because I really see Texas as the archetype for the rest of the country. In other words, Texas has in many respects, the attributes that America had as at its founding. Uh, and I see California as the, as the opposite of that. It's like the yin and yang of American states. Agreed. So I see California as uh, an example of what not to do. Uh, and I see uh, Texas as kind of the beacon to show the rest of the country, hey, this is what it could be like. Uh, and uh, just as, as the bottom line proof for any progressives that might mock what I just said, 
uh, if your governance of California has been so damn good, why is it that for the last three years in a row, you've been losing population? And that's including illegal immigration, immigration, legal migration, immigration, births over deaths. California is losing population for the first time three years in a row. And the number one place former Californians go is Texas. A lot of them, Austin. Uh, I know what you're saying is true. There's a TV show called Kill Tony. It started in California. He left because the COVID restrictions were too hard, moved to Texas with Joe Rogan. And now his show is exploding. And if you watch the show Kill Tony, every episode, basically he, he, you, you put your name in a bucket and he pulls five people out of the bucket to come and do stand up. So I want to be a stand up comedian. Here, buddy, you get your one minute and you're either going to do horribly and everybody's going to laugh at you or you might be a star and we'll introduce you to Rogan. So it's it goes either way. Half of the candidates. Last 60 episodes aren't from Texas. They're transplants. And they came in the last two years. So if you just watch that show, it's crawling with people going. So are you from Texas? No, I just got here. Are you, so what's your plan? No, I'm moving here. Yeah, it's. That show is a testament to people moving to Texas all the time. Uh, just backs up your point. I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as fast as I could. <laughs> I will we'll leave it there. I really appreciate the interview. Is there anything you'd like to say or leave the audience with? Or, or my favorite question, is there any thoughts you want the audience to think about that they can't get out of their head for the next Well, week? I mean, I, I just would chill uh, the book. That, uh, that I wrote that uh, in some ways uh, envisions an America in which uh, the national divorce um, happened early on, or rather we never even got united in the first place. And since you pulled out that 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 uh, movie jacket, which I thought was amazing, let me yeah. start over here and I'm gonna grab- Please, I'm gonna grab please. My latest book, it's called The Crisis of the House Never Everybody, United, a novel of early America, and um, and it's about a country uh, where a lot of Americans don't realize that the ratification of the Constitution was a very nearly one thing. It didn't happen, uh, and so I'm envisioning what would have happened. It's a historical fiction novel uh, about what would have happened if we didn't ratify the Constitution. John Jay, writing in the Federalist, a couple of times warned that we'd probably break into two or three, four different countries. Uh, that those countries would be natural rivals of each other and that they would seek support from European powers. You know, one might tilt to France, one might tilt to Britain, one to Spain. Right. That in short order, we might end at war with ourselves. And so uh, my book takes on that topic uh, through some very familiar um, people like Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and um, kind of lays out uh, without preaching why it is that our constitution uh, is really a, a, a pretty amazing document uh, should we decide to follow it. That's The Crisis of the House Never United, a novel of early America. And it, it's uh, if you like history and you like uh, alternate history, or if you like the, uh, I think the National Treasure movies with uh, Nicolas Cage, I highly recommend you look at this book. It kind of takes you through some of the early founding fathers and how things might have gone differently. If you like the, they had a TV series about what if the Nazis won World War II. It was really right. historical. And, and uh, it's funny you should mention uh, Cage and, and that film. I even have, I even have a map in, in my book. So... So there you go for for uh, for lovers of. <laughs> I'm a big map guy. I'm a big history fan. Yeah, check out the book, uh, and check out Chuck. He's at the Texas Policy Foundation. Really appreciate the interview. I think we might have reason to talk again in the future. I don't see the marriage counseling happening. Could be wrong. We'll have to see. Right. Um, it does strike me as interesting that. You had a sitting member of Congress, Marjorie Taylor Greene, talk about secession while she was in Congress. You had a sitting member of the Senate, Ted Cruz, talk about secession when he was in the Senate. Last time you had sitting members of Congress talk about secession, 1860. 
Well, I bet you if you look in the congressional record, it's probably happened more frequently since. But uh, look, there's 535 of those elected Congress critters. They're going to have a lot of different opinions. And with today's technology, uh, there's a lot of microphones around. So, um, uh, you know, we're in this ride together. Let's uh, pull together, uh, do what we can uh, as Americans to work together where we can and to respect our differences when we don't think we can. That would bring us back together. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. Thank you.